Welcome to chapter 22, the uh, connection between inflation and unemployment. However, this, this connection is only present in the short run, as, uh, as you'll soon see. In the long run, inflation and unemployment are completely unrelated. Remember, this is a nominal variable and this is a real variable, and they are not, um, according to the classical dichotomy, nominal variables cannot affect real variables in but this is really only in the long run. Inflation uh, depends on growth in the money supply. Remember, that's one of the principles. Money Prices going up is because the Fed is printing more money. Unemployment depends on things that change production, like the minimum wage, the market power of unions, efficiency wages, that's when the wages are too high, and the process of job search, right? So uh, one of the 10 principles, don't forget, was in the short run, however, society faces a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Let me show you. So in, uh, in economics, there is a curve called the Phillips curve. It shows the short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Where did it come from? 1958, a guy named Phillips, he showed that nominal wage growth and unemployment were negatively correlated. So nominal wage growth, don't forget, this is a price, okay, and it's negatively correlated with unemployment. So he saw that when this price went up, unemployment went down. Okay, in America, uh, Paul Samuelson and Robert Solo found the exact same relationship in the United States between all of U.S. inflation and unemployment, so they named it the Phillips Curve after this guy Phillips in 1958. All right, so how do, how do we get to it? Let's suppose that the price level is 100 this year. That's the CPI, right? So there are, let's also suppose that there are two possible outcomes for next year. One, we have aggregate demand low, so our economy is, is, is kind of low. Um, it's, it's not a boom. It's more like a bust, right? Maybe uh, the stock market is, is, is not doing quite well. Um, and so that will lead to a small increase in price, meaning low inflation, and high unemployment. How do we get high unemployment? Well, don't forget, when, when our GDP goes down here, that means that firms are very small and they're laying off people, which is going to make unemployment get high. So any time that, anytime that we have reducing Y, reducing GDP, we're going to get high unemployment. Okay, And that's going to be a, fi a fixture that we're going to notice many times in this chapter. Okay, the other option that we could have is a strong economy, aggregate demand high, which is going to make high inflation, big P, high output, big Y, which will lead to low unemployment. All right, let's show, let me show you. So here's, here's situation one where we have the low aggregate demand curve, and that is going to make a low level of inflation and a low level of Y, real GDP. So if the price only goes up to 103 right here, it started at 100, that's an inflation rate of 3%. And I just make up this 6% unemployment rate. Okay, let's suppose that there is a high aggregate demand, it's way up here, and it, the price is at 105, and we have a big Y, right? So this Y is much bigger. So when we're making a lot, our real GDP is very high, that means unemployment is low because everybody's needed to make these new products, okay? So that point looks like this. So if we were to trace out the Phillips curve, you notice it's downward sloping with the uh, y-axis of inflation and the x-axis of unemployment rate. So we say this is a trade-off, you see? It, uh, it's downward sloping like this. So if you want to make unemployment rate go down like this, you have to make inflation go up and vice versa. Okay, so basically when, when this was found out in the 60s, people thought, oh, policymakers, we can have a couple of choices. We can have low unemployment with high inflation, low inflation with high unemployment, or we can have anything in between. Now, why did policymakers have the ability to control this? Well, don't forget, last chapter we learned that policymakers can change the AD curve. They can do it two ways. One, with monetary policy, that means the Fed pumps money into the economy, or they can do it with fiscal policy, meaning the government um, increases government spending. All right, and so in the 1960s, the data supported this Phillips curve, and so most people believe that the Phillips curve was stable and reliable. Look at this. We see that from 1960 to 1968, we have perfect tracing. This looks very similar to the Phillips curve that I showed you on the previous slide, right? Downward sloping with inflation rate and unemployment rate on the two axes. Um, basically, what, what 
policymakers were doing is they started here in 1961, and then as they moved to 1962, they moved to 1963, 1964, they were pumping up the AD curve. They're pushing up the AD curve, which if you remember in the ASAD model, makes inflation go up and unemployment go down. However, okay, Milton Friedman and Edmund Phelps in 1968 said, no, this can't happen forever. Um, and they came up with this thing called the natural rate hypothesis, right? And you've actually already heard this from me. It's that unemployment and GDP, you know, why, returns to its normal or natural rate regardless of the inflation rate. And this basically is based on the classical dichotomy and the vertical long run aggregate supply curve. Let me show you. So here we are at the beginning. Um, and uh, we're at price level one and we're at the natural rate of output. If, and then of course we're at the low inflation rate. Now, if the Fed decides to pump more money into the government, into the economy, that pushes the AD curve up. Well, we know in the long run, we'll always come back to the natural rate of output because that's when we come back to the long run aggregate supply, which makes the Phillips curve, the long run Phillips curve over here on this side, just have high inflation, the same natural rate of unemployment. So how did this happen? Because in the 60s, everyone thought the Phillips curve went downward. Friedman and Phelps thought that the Phillips curve is vertical in the long run. So really, they come up, came up with this idea that it's actually expected inflation that makes the Phillips curve move. All right, so here was the equation they came up with, that the actual unemployment rate any year is going to be the natural rate of unemployment minus alpha times the actual inflation minus the expected inflation. So if the Fed can catch people off surprise and make this number high, like 10% of inflation, and people only expected, say, 7% inflation, this whole term becomes, say, 3. And then whatever the natural rate of unemployment was, let's say it's 6 minus 3, then the unemployment rate went down to 3. OK, so by raising the actual inflation above what people expect, we can make the unemployment rate go down but only in the short run because eventually people expect high inflation if you keep raising inflation on them. All right, so in the short run, they can reduce unemployment rate below the natural rate by making inflation greater than expected. But in the long run, people finally learn their expectations catch back up and they guess correctly. In other words, these two numbers are the same, which means these two numbers are the same in the long run. Okay, so here's how, how expected inflation shifts the, the Phillips curve. So let's suppose that expected and actual inflation is 3% and unemployment is at its natural rate of 6%. Now, let's say that the Fed catches people off guard and raises inflation 2% higher than expected, so we know that unemployment rate falls to 4%, right? It goes to B. However, in the long run, expected inflation increases, right? People don't keep guessing incorrectly, they guess properly and the Phillips curve shifts upwards and unemployment comes back to its natural rate. In the long run, everything always comes back to the natural rate here as given by the long run Phillips curve. Okay, let's do an example. Let's say that uh, the natural rate of unemployment is 5%, expected inflation is 2%, and in the Phillips curve equation, alpha is 0.5. So I want you to plot the long run Phillips curve and then find the unemployment rate for each of these values of actual inflation, that'll be two points. Sketch the short run Phillips curve. Then I want you to repeat it when expected inflation rises to 4%. You're going to get a new short run Phillips curve. And then finally, um, suppose the natural rate of unemployment falls to 4%, draw a new long run Phillips curve, and then, then the short run Phillips curve also. Why don't you hit pause, take a minute, and then come back. All right, so the, the long run Phillips curve is easy. The natural rate of unemployment is 5%, so that's the long run Phillips curve. Now to find the... Uh, the short run Phillips curve, I just plug this point here where I have zero inflation into the Phillips curve um, formula. And then I plug this point here where I have 6% inflation. And then that, that gives me these two numbers right here. And, and then I can go ahead and draw the curve that uh, connects those two points. If, in fact, the increase in expected inflation is of 2% is going to shift the Phillips curve over to the right by 1%. And then finally, if we had some um, technological progress or some change in our economy, this is not something that the government can change just with simple monetary policy. But if somehow the natural rate of unemployment fell to 4%, maybe people work harder, something like that, that's going to shift both curves to the left. 
All right, so um, let's continue on with our story. In the 60s, everyone thought that the Phillips curve was downward sloping. However, if you look at the, the ASAD curve, you can see if we keep moving the AD curve to the right, eventually in the long run, everything will come back uh, to the natural rate of, of output, but with a higher price. So what we should expect is that in the long run, inflation is still gonna increase and unemployment is going to increase, right? So we expect unemployment to increase as we come back to the natural rate of unemployment, and we expect inflation to increase um, as the short-run aggregate supply curve moves to the left, which means that we expect the points in the future to be in this direction over here. This is a bad region for the Phillips curve because we have high unemployment and we have high inflation. That's called stagflation. All right, so you see in 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, we see evidence that uh, expectations are catching up with reality and we're getting into this, this difficult area. Okay, um, unfortunately in 1973, something else happened, right? A supply shock, something that changed the aggregate supply curve, okay? And so when something changes the aggregate supply curve, it will also change the Phillips curve, okay? In 1973, we had a large increase in oil prices, the oil embargo. So here's what happens. On the left, I have the ASAD model. On the right, I have the Phillips curve. So on the left, we see that when the oil prices increase, it decreases supply, right? The supply curve moves to the left. This is what always happens with, uh, with, um, with supply when a supply shock happens. Okay, moves to the left. We have lower output and higher prices, okay? So you can see here, price is going up and output's going down. That means unemployment's going up. So what does it look like on the Phillips curve to have both um, prices go up and unemployment go up, right? That makes a brand new Phillips curve. The whole Phillips curve shifts to the right, okay? And so you can see that the, the oil shock really did happen. 1973, 1974, oil almost uh, went up 250%. So, and what did the Fed decide to do? Well, they decided to push up the AD curve with faster money growth. This made even higher expected inflation, which made the Phillips curve shift even farther to the right, okay? Um, and then, of course, in 1979, if you remember, the Iranian Revolution made the oil prices go up again. Look, between 1979 and 1981, um, the oil prices over doubled, okay? So you see this happened in 73, the, was the first, in 1973 was the first oil problem which as you can see made unemployment and inflation get even worse and then things started recovering but then in 1979 what happened the Iranian Iranian revolution and oil prices again and so we have uh, once again a time when unemployment increases and inflation increases okay so eventually they got to the point where people were like we have to reduce inflation we're almost at 10 percent okay Disinflation is what it's called when you reduce the inflation rate. Well, to reduce the inflation rate, the Fed's only tool is to move the AD curve to the left, okay? They move the AD curve to the left, which brings the price level down. In the short run, this is a big problem because real GDP output, it falls, which makes unemployment rise. In the long run, however, unemployment, output and unemployment go back to their natural rate, but in the short run, it's quite difficult. So in the long run, uh, if you have contractionary monetary policy, that means the Fed pulls money out of the, the government or out of the economy and it shifts the AD curve to the left, what happens? Well, that's going to make um, B, uh, the economy arrive at point B with lower inflation, yes, but higher unemployment rate. However, at, over time, the expected inflation falls and the PC curve shifts downwards and we get back to point C because in the long run we're always going to stay on the long run Phillips curve. It's just this couple of years that we spend out here at B with a high unemployment rate that's the big problem that people worry about. Okay, So you see that in order to, to do disinflation it requires enduring a period of high unemployment and low output. All right, We call this the sacrifice ratio. How much GDP do you have to get up to get rid of 1% of inflation? Well, most people think it's 5, okay? In other words, if you want to make inflation rate go down 1%, you have to give up 5% of GDP. GDP will go down 5%, okay? You can spread the cost over time, right? So say they needed to reduce inflation by 6%, you can either give up 30% of GDP for one year or 10% of GDP for three years. But either way, you're going to be having a, point of, a period of time with some high unemployment. All right, 
Um, however, though, some economists, notably Robert Lucas, Thomas Sargent, Robert Barrow, thought that there might be a way to do this not quite so, so uh, costly, all right? If people have rational expectations, which people do, basically people um, use all the information they can to try to predict the future, this means that disinflation could be less costly. Why? Well, suppose the Fed convinces everyone it's committed to reducing inflation, expected inflation falls, the short-run PC curve shifts downwards because um, they actually trust that the inflation is going to go down, so they don't actually wait to the long run. People just start living their lives as if inflation already came down, which makes the PC curve shift downward. Okay, that if, if this actually happens, disinflations can cause less unemployment than the traditional sacrifice ratio predicts. Okay, well, in 1981, it, they called upon Paul Volcker to uh, do a disinflation because there's way too much inflation in the United States. All right, so he was given the reins in 1979. He changed the Fed policy to disinflation. He um, had contractionary monetary policy. It even had to overcome the government spending. So the government was still spending. They were still the government itself was still trying to push up the AD curve. But what he had to do was he had to take a lot of money out to pull the AD curve down because he wanted to pull inflation down. Okay, inflation fell from 10% to 4%, but at the cost of high unemployment. Here's what happened. You see, 1979 he's appointed. 1980, 81 inflation gets really high. And then all of a sudden he starts uh, having contractionary monetary policy. So you see inflation is falling. But what else do you know? Look, unemployment rate is growing, right? It gets really huge in 82 and 83. It's almost nearly 10%. That's the highest that we've seen in a long time. However, the good news is as the long run occurs, right, unemployment falls because it's heading back towards the natural rate of unemployment. And then after Volcker, the Greenspan era. 1986, oil prices fell 50%. In 1989 and 1990, unemployment fell and inflation rose. So the Fed raised interest rates, which caused the AD curve shift to the left and made a mild recession. In the 1990s, unemployment inflation fell. So this is interesting. You can tell that obviously the PC curve is shifting to the left because if the PC curve was not shifting, then unemployment and inflation can't both fall at the same time. In 2001, this was the tech market bubble, uh, negative demand shocks uh, from the tech market made the AD curve shift to the left, it reduced it, created the first recession. Policymakers responded with expansionary monetary and fiscal policy to push the AD curve back up. And you see during the years of Alan Greenspan's tenure um, as the chairman, the uh, employment rate and inflation rate stayed pretty constant and hovered around just... Uh, around five and a half percent for an unemployment rate and about two and a half percent for inflation rate. After um, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke was tapped to be the head of the Fed. Um, unfortunately, right as he showed up, the housing market burst in 2006, which caused the AD curve to shift to the left. Sharp drop in the AD curve and a rise in unemployment. Okay, so you can see that during this time we had a fall in inflation and an increase in unemployment right here. That's exactly what the Phillips curve would predict. And then as the long run happened, we started coming back almost almost along the same exact Phillips curve coming right, right back. Um, so basically, the idea here is to show that uh, the theories of the great economists of the 20th century um, really focused on the ASAD curve and how inflation and unemployment could be controlled. Okay, And basically what we learned is that un inflation and unemployment are completely unrelated in the long run, right? They can't, inflation is nominal, it can't affect anything that's a real variable, but in the short run they're definitely negative re negatively related. Furthermore, they're affected by the expectations, so expectations shifts the Phillips curve and it also shifts our economy from the short run to the long run.